somebody called me up. I don't think it was Jay. I don't know who it was. It was somebody at Sunbow, and I can't remember who now. Sorry, whoever you were. And said, we're doing uh, a five-parter Transformers, uh, and we want you to write it. And it's going to be, the whole season is just going to be this five-parter. Yeah, five-parter. And, uh, key word there, five-parter. <laughs> and I went, uh, sure, because you guys pay more for your scripts than Marvel ever did. Uh, cool. <laughs> you know. And also, it's the Transformers, and I hadn't done it for a year and a half, and, 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 and I, I actually sort of missed it. And I went, okay, t show me what you got. And he said, well, we've got these new characters. We've got these things called Headmasters and Target Masters. And when they show me the thing and I count it, it's something like 130 because the heads become robots and the bodies are robots and the heads become vehicles and the bodies become vehicles and the weapons of the heads also are robots that become, you know, and it was like 130 characters or something like that. And I was like, I can do this, five parts, <laughs> I can do this. It's basically, you know, there are times when you can't do what you want and what you do is you take your marching order and this was what we call the toy parade. It was literally like, get the toys out, it's just to show the toys. You know, it, and it was, the, the nature of it was, you know, it's not like I could go, oh no, my artistic integrity will not allow me to do this. Give me some other tr Transformer toys to, to, to write about because those were the toys for that year's wave of Transformers. The problem was, I mean, there was a clever idea, they were clever ideas as toys, but they didn't really make for great characters because you have these sort of, you have these double robots and they were, uh, they were like aligned. There was like 12 headmasters and there were 12 target masters and there were 12, and how do you start differentiating and doing character and, you know, all that kind of stuff when you've got these guys who are sort of more or less identical. So basically, the first problem that faces you as a writer with a show like that is how do you introduce like 130, how do you create? Because we couldn't, ideally, I would just take them as like they were created before the beginning of the show and now we're, we're, we're coming on, they, they're pre-existing. That saves you a lot of headache. But the thing is, there were like Autobot headmasters and there were Decepticon headmasters. And it's like, well, wait a minute. They both thought this idea up independently. It's like, you have no choice but to show how, they make it about how they got created. Because first of all, it's such a wacky idea. <laughs> and second, it's like they both sides have, have them. So obviously, you know, I mean, that leads you to suggest one side comes up with them and the other side goes, oh, darn, they've got, you know, they, <laughs> wish, we had, wish we had us one of them doomsday devices, you know, and now we got to make our own headmasters. So uh, the story immediately became about how these characters came into being. And I thought I actually did a fairly clever idea of coming up with this whole idea of this planet where there was a rebellion and there was this thing called the Hive and they were just mind people because they're going to go in the heads of the headmasters and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and that became the thrust of the plot. And uh, I, you know, worked on characters for the individual headmasters and whatnot. And it was like really, it was really tight. With five episodes, it was really tight. But it managed to play out as sort of a semi-character thing. And I wrote the story outline, and I turned it into Sunbow of the whole five-parter. And they called back, and they said, we love it. It's great. Everything's wonderful. We've had a budget cut back. It's a three-parter. <laughs> and I went, you've got to be freaking kidding me. A three-parter? And I did some very quick math in, in my head, and I said, you know, if we brought these, with, with all the different characters we have to introduce, the new Transformer characters to introduce, if we brought them out, <clears throat> like, sequentially, we would be bringing on a new character, it's something like every 28 seconds. I mean, literally, it was somewhere between 30 and 90 seconds. I forget exactly, I, I have to redo the math, but it was, it was ridiculous. So, they said, just bring them on in gangs. Just bring on, you know, all 12 at once and all 12 at once, and which is what we wound up doing. It's still is the silliest thing in the world for me, to, for these guys. It's not so much that they come on and they've got these individual personalities, and I, I don't know, did they actually, go to, what is the machine that gives the Transformers their personalities? Oh, God, there's 18,000 fans out there going, it's Vector Sigma! <clears throat> okay, Vector Sigma. I don't think they got their personalities from Vector Sigma. Oh, because they were organic in nature. We actually, because of the, the, the we actually use people in this, the, the hive minds and whatnot. So they would have personalities, although they really had nothing much to do with their personalities before they became headmasters. But I loved how it's like, but they have to have the name, you know? Yeah, I'm Bullseye, and I'm, 
you know, I'm big brain and I'm, you know, it's like, it's like more importantly, it's not just that I've been turned into this weird cybernetic creature, but I got this neat name, you know. So what we wound up doing was cutting out just a chunks of story, you know, and plot like substance out of the thing and just bringing these guys on in gangs. So while that obviously didn't thrill me, there was one thing in doing this that I really liked, and to this day I still like about, about those three episodes, which is I kind of knew going in this was going to be the end of the Transformers. And, of course, it wasn't the end of the Transformers, but it was the end of these Transformers. And there was no place in the plot, really, for Optimus Prime because there was so much stuff going on. But I loved Optimus Prime. Uh, I was very glad that they brought him back, and I think it was Marv Wolfman who brought him back. Uh... I was talking the other day to Wendy Peeney, who is uh, a great, uh, one of the great comic book creators of this or any generation. She, she does ElfQuest. And she's a big cartoon fan. And she mentioned, or I mentioned Optimus Prime, and she said, the greatest leader character in the history of, like, you know, superheroes. I said, absolutely right. He is, like, the, one of the greatest characters I've ever written for. And, and the reason he works so well, and the fans, I mean, they, the fans brought him back, right? I mean, they killed him off in the movie. Why'd they kill him off? Well, the toy head was not selling anymore, right? Uh, and the fans just screamed, and they had to bring him back. Early on, I heard from my friend Bryce Malick, who's the story editor of the first 65 transfer, co-story editor with uh, Dick Robbins, uh, that very early on, Jeffrey Scott, who's a very well-known animation writer, was brought in to do some development at, on Transformers. And his big contribution was, on Optimus Prime, he said, he's Abe Lincoln. And I was like, that's brilliant. Of course, with malice toward none. Here's this guy who's, they're stuck on Earth. They're in a desperate situation. He's got all these fractious personalities who are constantly, you know, butting up against each other and having rivalries and whatnot. And he's the guy who can handle all of them. Just the most fantastic leader, even though he's a straight arrow and he, he really has no irony or anything. Just a great leader character. So, um, and in fact, such a great leader character that I actually, there was a show I did called Kremzeek, which was about these little energy demons, and I, I always called it my, my Roadrunner episode of Trans... It was the Transformers we tried to, where we tried to do a Roadrunner cartoon because Megatron sends this little guy over, this little ready kilowatt energy guy and he can jump into any of the Autobots and immediately shut them down make them go crazy and they make their heads spin around they shut down and like 92 percent of the Autobots get clobbered in the first like three minutes of this thing Spike and his dad come up with this way of insulating Optimus Prime and like three other the last three remaining ones and they chase after him he jumps into their screen he's off to Japan he can ride this this character can ride radio beams anything electrical he can ride on He's in Japan. They got to take uh, Omega Supreme and go over to Japan. They're, 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 and there's this, and, and they're chasing him, and it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And all the way through, they keep there's this running thing of they keep asking Prime, "Okay, Optimus, what's the plan?" He's, and Prime's going, "Who's had time to think of a plan? What are you talking about?" So what was wonderful about that was because he was always such an in control character. When he says the situation is out of control, you really believe it. It's really out of control. He was a great character, and, and I wanted to involve him deeply somehow in this, these final episodes of, of the original Transformers. So I came up with this whole idea of this mystical vision coming to him from uh, 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 Omega Supreme uh, that all of this horrible stuff that was happening with these new, this, this whole new war that seemed to be happening was actually for a good purpose. And the good purpose winds up being the, cre the, the rebirth of Cybertron. And granted, it was corny the way we did it, and it, it was certainly, certainly not the most scientific. You know, we pulled all the energy out of a sun or something silly like that, you know. This, those are the moments I call, okay, engage the balonium drive, you know. <laughs> but, but that it finally gave the Autobots a happy ending, that they got Cybertron back. And... Uh, uh, and in a way set up, if they had wanted to take it this way, where the, here the Decepticons are now completely, you know, exiled and disenfranchised, and the Autobots have the planet that they've been fighting over all these years. But to give, 
Optimus Prime something as massive to do as basically solving what has been the Autobots problem from show one, which is our home world is destroyed and we're stuck on Earth. I loved being able to do that. That was my, my that was worth just bringing on those gangs of headmasters and target masters, you know, in, in huge numbers. And they there was they had no characters to speak of, and they just you couldn't follow who was who or what was what. Uh, the, the basic problem, you know, and and why we couldn't do what I was talking about with doing character stories is just the toy line. Uh, there were too many toys. They were all too similar. Uh, that that was a slight problem. I did a two parter called the Key to Vector Sigma where uh, we created the aerial bots who were the, the flying Autobots and the Stunticons who were the driving Decepticons. Where those are vehicles that neither side had had before. And uh, uh, they, were, they were like four, I think four each or five each. And you can only give one or two of them really strong personalities. So whenever you have a gang, you just are not doing your strong character show. And I, I mean, we had like 100, and I swear, it's like something like 130 on this. It was, you know, that, that the show, that those three episodes remotely are watchable is like almost a miracle. But I, I really did all the stuff, the stuff with the headmaster one I didn't like, but the stuff with, with Optimus Prime, I just loved. I loved being able to write that character again. How Cerebro sort of came to be the lone voice in the wilderness is... Um, it just sort of came out of logical thinking, and again, it's something that got cut way back when it went when it got scrunched down from five episodes to three. <clears throat> but you assume that the intelligent people are going to become the heads. It's just logical thinking, and that then led me to think, well, you know, an intelligent person would be against all this war, and therefore we must have a character who says. He, what he really is is Adelaide Stevenson in you know the Situation Room or the the Oval Office or whatever where they're having the meetings on the Cuban Missile Crisis and and the, or do we blockade do we do we actually go in and attack and all these generals are pushing for you know this, these hawkish moves against Cuba and Adelaide Stevenson said you know why don't we just like openly talk with them and nobody wanted to do that because it sounded like appeasement like what uh, 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 Neville Chamberlain had done with with Hitler. And, but somebody had to do it. Afterwards, JFK said somebody had Adelaide. Adelaide did the thing that somebody had to do. And my feeling was somebody had to had to say, you know, this is wrong, no matter what. This kind of violence is wrong. And also, I thought, oh, what a sneaky little thing to <laughs> to put in a Sunbow show, where there's like the, the sort of the wall to wall, no consequence violence, uh, because they're wrong. And and this also coming from a guy who tried to write the single most violent episode of Transformers, which was called War Dawn. Uh, it got, it got, I actually wrote a sequence that was so violent, they cut it, that Sunbow or somebody cut it back. Uh, I don't know if you remember War Dawn, but that was, um, it's actually one of my two favorite episodes that I wrote. It, uh, we had created the aerial bots, who were the flying Autobots, and they were young and naive. And, uh, and, and I thought, well, there's, there was something about Rambo was really big at the time, and 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 Schwarzenegger movies and whatnot. And there was this sort of love of this sort of macho character, and and I thought, what if somebody could see the reality behind that? So I had these naive, new, newly born uh, Autobots go. Well, you know, the Decepticons are, are really powerful. That's you know, you know, maybe we're on the wrong side. These guys, you know, have an iron will. And the leader, who's sort of the insecure one, going, and like, you know, guys, not really. So what we th what we then did was threw them back in time. They they that leads them into a, a Decepticon trap that on Cybertron that throws them back in time to literally two days or a day before the war between the Decepticons and the Autobots started, and um, they get to see firsthand the consequences of war, and. They make friends with a, a, a robot named uh, Orion Pax and his friend, his girlfriend Ariel and, and another robot. And there was some wonderful bonding stuff that they wound up cutting out of the episode, which would have made it. The script was perfect. The episode had a few problems. But, uh, and, and they bond with the, you know, and they go, wow, these are great guys. And then the war starts. And the way the first, sh I said, we're going to, I'm going to write the first shot in the, in this, 
millennia long war between these two forces. And it's going to be because, okay, if you haven't seen the episode and you're a Transformers fan, just turn the volume down now, okay? Because this is spoiler warning, okay? Spoiler ahead. Orion Pax is going to be reborn as, as Optimus Prime. And, but he needs to be killed first to be reborn as Optimus Prime. And uh, so what, you know, I, he's going to be the first one to get shot, and he's going to get shot by Megatron. And this is Megatron's, even though chronologically, obviously, we've seen a whole lot of Megatron before this. So, you know, really in the chronology of the show, this is the first bad thing Me Megatron ever does. I always believe that the villain has to kick the dog, and the harder the villain kicks the dog, and the nastier the villain kicks the dog, the better it is, because the more you go, oh, yes, when the villain gets it at the end. So, in the script, <laughs> Orion Pax, soon to be Optimus Prime, comes up to Megatron and goes, hi, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just doing some unloading. And, and, and then, and, and, and he goes, well, you're not supposed to be in here. It's, it's, and Megatron goes, oh, I can be wherever I want. And he whips out his blaster. He shoots Optimus at point-blank range, and this they actually did keep in. He shoots Orion Pack right in the shoulder at point-blank range. That part they kept in. He blows his arm off, and he, this they didn't keep in. He takes his arm and decapitates him <laughs> with it. <laughs> that they cut. But I'm the guy who wrote the anti-war scenes, and I have this sort of weird duality <laughs> about me. Uh, uh, but that that was probably, and that never never made quite final air in that form. But the, the scene is still moderately, you know, disturbing, even the way they did it. But I just love that. Just knock his head off with his own arm. And and then when uh, when he when he's reborn at the end of the episode, his opposite is Prime, and, and, and Megatron goes, "Who are you?" And he goes, "Your worst nightmare." Boom! You're like, "Yes, get the Prime." <laughs> Last night I was talking to somebody and they said, you know, the new Turtles are looking for a writer. Why don't you go talk to them? And I was like, you know, I did 100 episodes. I think I made my statement in that. And then I was thinking, is there any show that I would ever, if they brought to me, that I ever want to write before again? And it was Transformers. Uh, Turtles will always be my favorite show because I am those four guys. I just took myself or who I wish I was and broke myself into four pieces and, and put it into those guys. But number two would absolutely have to be Transformers because they were such great characters. That's why it still lives. Is is not you know it, it isn't because of 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 you know the way the and all the folding and all that. What got it started was like any of these kids' phenomena from from Transformers to Pokemon to Power Rangers, is it's the thing kids get that adults totally don't understand. You could see the kids could and do the transformations with it, you know, in two seconds, and, and their fathers would be going, you know, and, and it makes kids feel empowered. Um, but what kept, what has kept such a strong fan base alive is they're just great characters. It was a great situation. It's somehow or other this very crass commercial setup of we've got 192 toys that we need to publicize. Uh, came together in such a way that it was it, it was the lightning in the bottle that you, you every once in a while hear about. And I was actually thinking just last night, you know, I wish they'd bring them back. I actually, I, I have a couple of story ideas. <laughs> you know, so in my heart, it's second only to Turtles. I, I really enjoyed working on it.